Welcome, my name is Derek Abbott and this is the second in a series of lectures on the Sumerton case. In this lecture we're going to look at the photographs that were taken of the body after the autopsy and ask what we can learn from them. This lecture does contain uh, photos of dead people. Please turn off this video if it is inappropriate for you. So the question we are addressing in this series of lectures is who is this man? He was found dead in 48, there was no cause of death, and to this day we still do not know his identity. So this is a second in a series of lectures. Please see the first lecture first if you haven't seen it already. So the body in 48 was taken to the West Terrace Mortuary where uh, Dr. Dwyer, in the presence of Scan Sutherland, performed the autopsy on the 2nd of December. Organs of the body were sent off to Robert Cowan to do chemical analysis, uh, which came up negative on all counts. The following day, on the 3rd of December, uh, Jimmy Durham uh, took photographs of the body. So this is the key point, is that the photos were taken after the autopsy. So this is the frontal photo that Jimmy Durham took and this is the side photo of the unidentified Summerton man. And the question is, what can we learn from these photos? Well, the first point I want to make is by showing you a, an autopsy photo of a different person. Quiz, who is this? Can anybody guess? The answer is, of course, Marilyn Monroe. However, if I was shown this photo and told it was an unidentified person we needed to find, I would not have guessed that as Marilyn Monroe. There's no way I could have worked that out from that photo. So this demonstrates how hard it is to identify people from their autopsy photos. Here's another one. Can you guess who this is? Answer, of course, JFK. Again, I would never have guessed that myself. So let's look closely at a before and after photo of JFK. Notice there are some features that are preserved, the features in the ear and some of the hairline, but the eyes have sunken in, the face has sunken in, especially the mouth and the chin, and the chin has got puffy underneath. So I would find this very difficult identifying who this is unless I really just concentrated on the ear and a bit of the hairline. I would not be able to identify that person unless I had somebody to match the ear with. So now going back to the photo of the Somerton man, uh, we have to now make it clear that it is very difficult to imagine what that guy was like when he was alive. We must talk about what we must exclude from this photo and the things we should pay attention to in the photo. So the first thing you must exclude is the general appearance of the man. The general appearance of Marilyn and the general appearance of JFK doesn't help to identify them. It is the specific features like the ear. So let us look at some other extra features we should exclude in the case of the Somerton man. Firstly, um, there is a crease above his nose, which should be excluded as that is an autopsy artifact. The black slits along his eyes should be excluded. This is because he has no eyes after the autopsy. Just the general expression on the face uh, and the mouth, uh, the way it's shaped, uh, we have to exclude that. That is, the person holds his face differently when he's alive. And the puffiness under the chin is probably should be excluded. We must also exclude the bump on the forehead, that is an autopsy artifact. This is called skull cap slippage. The skull is sawn during the autopsy, the brain is taken out, and when the skull cap is replaced, the weight of gravity pulls it down, creating that bump on the forehead. These uh, neck folds should also be excluded. This would not have been there when he was alive. This is also an artifact of the autopsy and the fact his head is on a mortician's block. 
You will have noticed the JFK photo also had those neck folds and so does the Marilyn Monroe photo. So this is quite a common thing after the autopsy. Another artifact, probably not of the autopsy but more of the photo itself, is his eyebrows seems to stop short here. This is probably just an artifact of the photo because the eyebrow is there on the plaster bust of the Sumpton man. It appears the photo may have been touched up to make it palatable for newspapers so that uh, children might see a picture of a dead person so as not to frighten them. Some of the blotchiness on the skin may have been touched up and so the eyebrow accidentally got removed. But that is just a guess there. Let's also exclude these scars here. And uh, now let's talk about the things that we should pay attention to. What are the key features that will help us match this guy against a plausible candidate? So the first thing that's probably going to stay mostly invariant is the hairline. The fact he has a straight nose is called a Greek nose. This is going to be invariant. Doesn't mean he's Greek, that's just the name of the type of nose. Also, he clearly has a mole on the um, right side of his mouth. And you can see that is true because it appears in both photos, so it's not a piece of dirt on the photo. His ear will have preserved features. Ears, unless they've been damaged, have uh, are like fingerprints. And uh, as you saw in the JFK photo, the ear was preserved. However, note we only have the right ear of the Somerton man. We don't know anything about his left ear. And you cannot go by the plaster bust because the bust uh, had great difficulty in reproducing the ear. So we, can, we have to ignore the bust. Another key thing to notice about the Somerton man's ear is the upper hollow of his ear is much larger than the lower hollow. And the upper hollow is called the simba. Notice a normal person's ear has a very small simba followed by a large lower cavity called the cavum. This is the opposite way around on the Somerton man. So this is a rare feature that is worth looking out for. Another feature is he has attached lobes. In case you don't know what that is, here's the comparison between detached and attached lobes. Another feature is he has a very pronounced nasal arched. He doesn't have a flat arch. He has a nice curved one. So this is another feature to look out for. He doesn't have hooded eyelids. Now what does that mean? Well, look at the actor Paul Newman. He has hooded eyelids because the upper eyelid goes straight down. Whereas the actor Laurence Olivier has a not hooded eyelid because he has a fold in that eyelid like most people do. General observations, of course, are that the guy is obviously male and he is Caucasian. So these are the things that are absent that he doesn't have. So if your potential uh, candidate identity for the Somerton man has some of these things, then you need to count him out. So let's do an example of how we can use some of these features and absences to exclude possible uh, candidates. So here's an example. I was sent an email a while ago from a member of the public saying that perhaps the Somerton man is Glenn Miller. And I thought that's a strange suggestion. But then when I looked at the photo of Glenn Miller, I saw a similar hairline there. The eyelid is not hooded, as for the Somerton man. And there is a nice Greek nose there. The guy is obviously Caucasian and male, has the general shape of the face, so seems like a good candidate. But why would he be dead on a beach in the Southern Hemisphere when Glenn Miller is from the Northern Hemisphere? Well, if you look at his biography, you find that he disappeared in '44. So it may seem a reasonable suggestion. Hey, Glenn has disappeared, so Perhaps we have a dead body here that might explain that disappearance. However, there's something strange here, something odd, and that is that he disappeared in 44, whereas our dead body was found in 48. 
So as you can see already, there is a big stretch there. You've got to hypothesize that Glenn Miller disappeared in the Northern Hemisphere in 44, kept in hiding somehow for four years so no one, when nobody could see him and then suddenly was found dead in 48. So that is obviously very implausible straight away. So you shouldn't be surprised that I'm skeptical of this, of this hypothesis. But people can add on to this hypothesis all sorts of possible explanations. Maybe it's working for a spy agency, maybe, uh, and spy agencies can do anything, they can keep you hidden for four years. But the problem with a hypothesis like that is that can be used to explain anything. It's an all-encompassing hypothesis, a deus ex machina, if you like, and you can use that to explain away anything. So, it's highly implausible. Of course, it's quite possible that happened, but it's also possible that elephants might fly. The question is, is it plausible? So, uh, rather than get caught up in that debate about plausibility, it's better just to find some eliminating features and look at the anatomy of the face. So, straight away we see that Glenn Miller has a chin cleft, whereas the Somerton man does not. And Glenn Miller doesn't have the mole. Furthermore, Glenn Miller has a much wider earlobe, and so you can eliminate his ear type straight away. Another a clincher is, of course, that Glenn Miller was shorter than the Sumpton Man uh, by about two inches. So you would have to hypothesize that he magically grew by two inches, which is extremely implausible. Also, we see that uh, Glenn Miller's canine teeth are in the right place, whereas the Sumpton Man's canine teeth were right next to his middle teeth. So I think uh, you should all be convinced that Glenn Miller is not our man. We will uh, have another lecture later in the series where we'll go through a whole uh, host of different examples and we will have fun eliminating or, or possibly including them depending on the available information. And so this will give us some, uh, some idea how this is done. So. Uh, if you like this lecture and you want to help in some way, we do encourage crowdsourced research. Uh, please uh, go to this Reddit website if you want to find some interesting open questions to work on. If you would like to help in terms of funding this research, look at the Indiegogo website as every now and again we will do a campaign for funds as there are quite a few different types of costs involved in this type of endeavour. If you would like to simply support us, a great way to do this is to sign this petition on change.org and this petition is for exhumation of the body. From the exhumation we will be able to uh, do things such as a bone isotope test to find location information about where the man has been and perhaps where he was born and also DNA information. All these factors will be vital in identifying him. If you wish to contact me, here are my details. Thank you.